Salt was a vital commodity on the American frontier. People used it for everything from hide tanning to seasoning of food, but especially for food preservation. Without it, most people would not have been able to feed themselves through long, harsh winters. Today on the Deerskin Diary, we're gonna take a deeper dive into salt production on the American frontier, so stick around. There's bound to be a grain in here that you can use. There's a key concept in this salt tale that permeates the entirety of human history. And that's the simple fact that the landscape plays the people and the people play the landscape. The Ohio Valley was once covered with a vast inland sea, some of the waters being trapped underground after the sea disappeared. This resulted in many of the licks that formed in the area. The salt brines of the Ohio Valley are known to be saltier than the ocean itself, with the ocean water having about a 3.5% mineral composition and the salty brine from some of the Ohio Valley licks having a 25% mineral content. As the briny water made its way to the surface, it formed licks, described by geographer Gilbert Imlay as, quote, a salt spring is called a lick from the earth about them being furrowed out in a most curious manner by the buffalo and deer, which lick the earth on account of the saline particles with which it is impregnated. These licks were so numerous that bison made their own paths between them, forming what eventually became many of the traces and roadways that opened the frontier to settlement. But in a tragedy worthy of a Greek playwright, it was the salt that attracted the game, particularly the bison. And it was the bison that made the roads. And it was the roads that allowed the hunters, both native and European, to pursue the bison and eventually decimating that population east of the Mississippi River. And what's interesting is places like Georgia and Virginia that didn't have the number of licks that Ohio and Kentucky had from a frontier sense did not develop the same way that Kentucky and Ohio did. It was in large part the presence of these licks and the abundant game that led European settlement there in the first place. John Filson, Kentucky historian and the first Boone biographer, wrote that, quote, many fine salt springs constantly emit water, which being manufactured affords great quantities of fine salt. The amazing herds of buffalo which resort thither by their size and number fill the traveler with amazement and terrors, especially when he beholds the prodigious roads they've made from all quarters as if leading to some populous city. One lick was called Big Bone Lick and it had a unique trait to it. For centuries animals flocked to this particular lick for its salt content and many of them got stuck in the muddy sludge and died in place resulting in piles of bones sticking out from the earth. Now, many of these bones belong to ancient animals like mammoths, mastodons, bison, saber-toothed cats, and ground sloths. Settlers in the 1700s visited the place in an almost tourist-like manner. In 1775, Nicholas Cresswell visited what he called elephant bone lick. He described it in his diary as, quote, where the bones are found is a large muddy pond, a little more than knee deep with a salt spring in it, which I suppose preserves the bones sound. Found several bones of prodigious size. I take them to be elephants, for we found part of a tusk about two foot long, ivory to all appearance, but by the length of time had grown yellow and very soft. If landscapes played the people and vice versa, cultures played off of one another as well, borrowing useful traits that helped their survival rate in the same environment. For example, it's likely natives that first made salt in the interior of North America in clay vessels, later using brass trade kettles like this one to, uh, to produce salt. And they eventually provided that information to Europeans. James Adair discussed one native method for making salt when he wrote that, quote, 
They make salt for domestic use out of a saltish kind of grass which grows on rocks by burning it to ashes, making strong lye of it, and boiling it in earthen pots to a proper consistence. Adair may have been referring to salt grass, which is a type of native grass that secretes salt from its blades that it gathers up through its root system. James Smith, after his capture and adoption by a Mohawk family, stated that, quote, we then moved to the buffalo lick where we killed several buffalo, and in their small brass kettles they made about a half bushel of salt. The Cato tribe was known for its salt making, producing salt refinement processes in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas to produce a salt that some claimed rivaled the finest salts in France. Natchitoches, Louisiana's oldest settlement, was located nearly adjacent to what is now known as the archeological site of Drake's Salt Works. As people explored the frontier, salt became a bit of an Achilles heel. You see, if they weren't getting it shipped from Fort Pitt in the east or getting it shipped north from Louisiana or the coast, they had to learn to make it themselves. Long hunters and frontiersmen knew all about the licks because they provided reference points in the landscape and the abundant game they sought. Even still, there was another use for licks that developed over time. Making salt became a pretty large endeavor at the saltiest of the licks. While some salinity proved some licks inferior, a couple rose to the top for their ability to satisfy the demand for the needed quantities of salt. Large iron kettles were hauled into the backcountry in order to have a vessel that could evaporate the unwanted liquid and harvest the remaining salt crystals. Now the hardest part of salt making was probably cutting the vast amounts of firewood needed to keep the pots boiling for days on end, while also trying not to be killed or captured by natives who were trying to fend off the Europeans marching into their ancient hunting lands. Now to make the salt today, I had to make a mineral brine water because acquiring mineral water from one of these licks is virtually impossible. A lot of them aren't producing mineral water like they used to. And it was even hard in the 1700s, right? They had to uh, dig wells to access the saltiest of the water. So what I did was I researched the salinity of the ocean. And through some additional research, it uh, is an accepted um, ratio that the water at the saltiest of the licks in Ohio and Kentucky were about 25% saltier than the ocean water itself. So I did some math and came up with a cup of mineral salt per gallon of spring water. And that's what I did in order to replicate some of the water that they may have had at the mineral springs themselves. Now I've got some of the salt that uh, I boiled down in this horn spoon here, and what I'm struck by first and foremost is the color. Now I started with the mineral salt, which has a bit of a pink or reddish hue to it, um, but it's definitely become grayer. It's retained some of that pink hue, but it's definitely become a grayer or paler salt, and it also has imperfections in it from ash and other things in the air that settled into the pot as it boiled over that open fire. It's a very, very fine texture. It's almost like sand, um, like the finest of beach sand. And boy, is it ever salty. Really have to, I think, watch using this to season your food um, as a standard seasoning because you'll over salt it very quickly. But I could see how important this type of salt would be for food preservation. It's such a fine grain and it has such a, uh, such a high saline content to it that uh, I could see it evaporating the moisture out of things like bacon um, and wild game meat to preserve it over those long winters. Well, once again, I found myself taking advantage of one of life's simplicities, and that's that box of Morton salt on the counter or that salt shaker on the table at the restaurant. Uh, it does not reveal the complex history of salt, especially on the American frontier. Now I'm gonna be using some of this salt in future episodes to season some campfire meals, and I hope that we can travel back in time together, even if only for a few seconds. And we'll see you next time on the Deerskin Diary.